so that should be recording. I cool. Mean, so you, you, you got a, you got a, I see, I think I saw you had a drink there, Ryan. I do. I do have a drink here. Paul, did you get a drink? Zay, I have, yes. Um, oh. I'll, I'll, um, I'll tell you what it, I, th I think I've had this before, Jeff. I'm not sure if I have or not. Um, it, look, it looks fruity. It's Thatcher's Rosé. <laughs> or, or, or Thatcher's Rose, I think they say in the West oh, it's, it's got an accent. Um, well, I haven't opened it yet. For the purposes of, presumably, Ryan, you'll, you'll do, a, you'll do a, a normal Agile for Humans introduction, nice and clean, and, and you'll introduce. We, we tend to, on the Agile podcast, we tend to mm, make it up as we go along a little bit. <laughs> I'm good with it. Oh, not, quite, hey. not quite as professional as you, Ryan, but no, so, definitely not. For, for everybody's benefit here, who, All right. that we'll, do, we'll do a quick introduction and, and scene setting. Very so I'm good. Jeff Watts, and this is Ryan Ripley, who's joining me and Paul Goddard on an inaugural and groundbreaking crossover <laughs> from the two most popular Agile-related podcasts in the world. Fact. Fact. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Agile for Humans in the Agile podcast. And um, it was always going to be a remote episode anyway, because yeah, we're on the on other sides of the Atlantic. Um, but we're remote anyway by, by government decree now. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's legal. It's, it's even, legal. Even, it's, even it's, me and Jeff can't get together. In it. We can't actually go to a pub. This is a quite, quite yeah. clear guidance from the government. Yesterday, the government came out in the UK and said, don't go to pubs. But... They didn't say to the pubs, you have to shut. Poor old pubs. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so yeah, Ryan, do you want to say a quick, quick hi? Yeah, hi. I'm Ryan Ripley. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, uh, we do Agile for Humans, but I'm a big fan of the podcast. So I listen to Jeff and Paul quite a bit. And so, awesome. Thanks for, thanks for doing this crossover, guys. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a way forward. It's a great opportunity, isn't it? And um, I know I feel a bit feel a bit guilty saying, trying while well, being positive, and you kind of when the when the world is so uh, sort of scared and, and, and negative in a way, it, you do kind of feel a bit guilty thinking, well, there's 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 good times and happy times, but it's an, it's an opportunity to to try things, and you know, necessity is the mother of invention, and um, so yeah, I think that could be could be something we talk about, but. Uh, I'm I'm drinking. So Paul, you're drinking a Thatcher's rosé, and it which is what? It's an incredibly sweet red um, Somerset cider. So it's all oh. apples. Oh, it's hundred percent apples, mate. Hundred percent apples. It's beautiful. It's it's almost um, like a like a cordial. It's abs absolutely fantastic. Um, okay. And I'm very much enjoying it. And uh, yeah. what, what have you got, Ryan? So I am drinking. Uh, off Square Brewery. It's actually close to my to my home, so it's a, a brewery in Crown Point, Indiana. Um, I, for the pubcast listeners, I talk funny because I'm in I'm an American. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, it's Off Square Brewing, and it's the the 65 South Pilsner. So it's a very nice Pilsner that uh, is made locally here in the, in Indiana. Cool. I'm drinking a Clockwork Tangerine. Oh. Which is made by Brewdog Brew, which is a, a Scottish brewery. So they're not particularly local to me, but um, I'm a big fan of Brewdog. I, I like their experimentation. So this is very much a sort of, as it would say, it's a citrusy IPA hoppy type thing. Sounds lovely. Yeah, sort of. Um, do, would you have marmalade? Would Would that word mean anything to you, marmalade? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because um, I don't know, some, some English words don't travel very well. But uh, over here, we don't often have my orange marmalade on our toast, maybe in the mornings for a breakfast thing. And it's it's kind of got it's kind of got that sort of taste. If you imagine that in a beer, very nice. Yeah, I'm, cheers. I'm, cheers, yeah. chap. Cheers. <clears throat> a raising glass. Cheers. Nice. You know, I am curious though. I mean, St. Patrick's Day, right? It is. How I'm having a kind of Guinness. Guinness. How oh, do you keep, well. <laughs> I mean, uh, on your guys' island, how do you keep everybody out of pubs on St. Patrick's Day? Well, it's, it's, it's an absolute um, unprecedented event in Ireland today where they've cancelled the St. Patrick's Day parade. I think the first time maybe ever. Yeah. Wow. And it's, it's, it's an even more um, stringent uh, restriction. On, I, don't, I think pubs are even closed, aren't they, in Ireland? 
I think uh, schools are closed, lots of things are closed in Ireland. Yeah, so normally they would turn the, uh, turn the Liffey green and have all sorts of parties and festivities in the streets, but not today. It is crazy. So <laughs> it's kind of interesting. The three of us actually do very similar work, right? So for the listeners who don't know, um, so Jeff Watts, the author of Scrum Mastery, um, it's the book that I, so when I hire scrum masters, like I'll get hired by companies to build teams and every scrum master I hire gets a copy of Jeff's book. Um, I think it's one of the cleanest representations of servant leadership ever. So it's awesome book. He and Paul are CSTs with Scrum Alliance. Um, and they teach the, the in-person two day classes. You know, I'm a professional scrum trainer with scrum.org, very similar, um, types of businesses. Like, how are you guys holding up? Like during this time, I'm curious you know, I know that both Scrum Alliance and Scrum.org had said, yeah, you can do virtual classes, but I'm scratching my head at what a in-person two-day class looks like online. But um, for you guys, I mean, how are things from, I guess, from that perspective, I mean, what are you up to? So um, I'll, I'll have to go first. So I, I don't run that many classes. So I've only got one class that uh, sort of CS PO like product owner or a scrum master course scheduled in the next couple of months anyway so I'm actually just using that as an opportunity to experiment uh, and Paul's helped me we, we went through that together because we, we kind of teach similar kind of things so we thought well rather than I try and figure out how to turn my class and Paul we, we did that together over over zoom and we kind of surprised at how much we thought we could we could change um so I've only got one of those. Most of my time, when you, your question was, what do I do? Most of my time, I'm, I'm working sort of two, three days a week with with a particular client who, oh, are, nice. who are trying to change their organizational structure, policies, you know, spin up new squads, get people, hire new people into new roles, change leadership culture and stuff like that. And they're all forced to work from home. So I'm trying to support them remotely um, while, while they try and set up something that they fully intended to be more co-located I don't know what you're doing Paul yeah it's a sim similar I'm perhaps a bit more I had a few more things lined up Ryan in terms of uh, training classes which and conferences I was uh, I made podcast listeners will, will may remember my um, one of my new year's resolutions was to try and get out to more conferences um, and I was preparing I'd been preparing a lot of materials and a lot of um, sessions to run at those conferences in my downtime when I had it and that's all kind of been put onto the back burner for the, for the moment obviously a lot of conferences have already announced that they're either postponing or cancelling altogether so I've um that's been parked I've picked up I've had to cancel or, or postpone a lot of my um scheduled private or public courses and like Jeff said I've, I've offered one client one um fairly um long-standing relationship I have with a client has agreed to um, virtualize a CSM with me this week so that's I'm in the frantic throes at the moment you probably can't see it from the cameras <laughs> um, but a lot of my um, area here is has been moved to try and um, make it more broadcastable to a for a two-day format so Jeff and I went through something and we've we've got kind of what we think might be a two-day agenda for that so Cool. Yeah, it's very much that the, they're really are uh, prepared to go right with me on it, and because they are effectively a guinea pig for this this type of teaching, which has never happened since I've become a CST. So it's it's a new thing, completely new thing. So have you tried, Ryan? Have you tried? Have you, have you got anywhere with that question that you were asking yourself? Um, so I'm trying to figure out. So I, I do a lot of co-training with Todd Miller. You know, he and I wrote the, the book together. We teach together quite a bit in person. We're trying to figure out, um, trying to get a feel for whether or not uh, we can actually do this online. And uh, I, we're not sure. Yeah. Um, so I, we're going to give it a shot. Like I, as you can see, I have a, well, the listeners probably can't see it, but we've got an office set up and multiple cameras and we're trying to see like, can we create a decent experience that would, um, that would cross over. We think we can. So we're going to look at that. We've honestly, we've signed another book deal. So we're working on, we're trying to see over the next six to eight weeks, if we can just get that first draft done. You know, Jeff, you know, the, the, the throws and the, the challenges and the, uh, just the, the sheer uh, misery of writing a book. 
Um, <laughs> and so we're, we're working through that. Uh, we're also looking at like complimentary online course offerings. I'm a big fan of teachable.com. Yeah. And we've been checking that out quite a bit, but I, you know what? I'm on the fence, to be honest. I know I'm supposed to be like Mr. Positive and, and all that, but I'm just kind of like, man, are the students really going to get everything that we have oh. to offer out of a virtual? And I, I, I want to try it, but I'm just kind of like, uh, oh, what do we, what do we do here? You know, it's skeptical. Yeah. I think, uh, right. I think, um, I think I've been quite lucky that I've got a, a good relationship that I can lean on in that respect. And, I've been quite open with this particular company and said, even these words, I've said, I don't think it's going to be that good um, or as good. So, but they're prepared to go with it. A lot of them are fairly, um, their scrum masters are fairly um, advanced, not advanced, but experienced. So I don't, if they've got a lot of people in the room who are quite comfortable with the framework already. So, but yeah, that it is very much a, a trial I've told them that it's um it's probably a temporary thing and it's probably not going to be as interactive and and as um powerful maybe but it's 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 kind of how we've got to work so I, I get what I get the, the, the positioning there and I, I I think naturally I would probably adopt a similar kind of expectation lowering yeah that you, you've taken there but I think what the one downside to that is you're introducing a, a certain element of confirmation bias in that people are now expecting it to be not very good um, now, we when we when we got together, Paul, to to look at this the product owner course, I was genuinely positively surprised by actually what you could do now. Yeah. With some free and really quite simple, widely available tools, and uh, I was talking to someone uh, earlier on about I've 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 got new facts, and I was trying to explain that. 15 years ago, well, 16 years ago, when I was training to be a scrum trainer, I had a ridiculously bad fear of public speaking. Paul knows this, maybe you don't, Ryan, I don't know, but I, I was awful. You know, I'd stand up in front of the room and I would be sweating and my, my, my voice would be cracking and I'd be just hating it. My, my, my heart would be racing and I just absolutely hated that, that thing. But when I was working at BT, there was, it was either me do it or they had to pay loads of money for someone from America to come over and run it. So they said, Jeff, you have to do this and um, sort of thrown into the deep end, if you like. And I knew for a fact back then that I would never be able to run a really good in-person course. I thought I could probably get to a point where I could get through it, mm. but I knew for a fact I would never be as good as Ken Schwaber, who, who's, um, who's sort of the, the, the scrum.org mentor, um, who yep. I was kind of teaching with. And over time, that fact has somewhat changed. You know, the evidence and the feedback has, has been actually, Jeff, yeah, you can do that. And, I, and I, I kind of think that. And my facts around coaching have changed as well. I knew for a fact about five years ago that coaching over the internet would be nowhere near as effective as coaching um, face-to-face, one-to-one. Um, but again, the evidence has forced me to reconsider those facts. And so my, my new fact that I was challenging recently is that teaching online will never be as as good as in person um and just from planning this i'm already questioning that fact and maybe through experience um and enough trial and error maybe i could replace that fact with a new fact again yeah it's interesting the the stories we tell ourselves and what actual perceptions and realities are they're wildly different and even as i'm listening to you jeff i'm thinking i finished Uh, my college degree. So for all of you over there, I finished university um, online, right? So I started, I started in person, um, left that after a couple years and went into the workforce and then kind of went back and did a couple years uh, of school online. And and as I'm listening to you talk, I was kind of thinking through um, in between my kids coming in here and fighting, um, (laughs) you know, I think the online experience can be amazing. It's what the students decide to make of it. And that's what I remember most from, from finishing a, a degree online is that if I decided to dig into the material to really be an active participant, if I focused on pulling the most out of that experience, it was great. And during a few classes where, you know, when you see that light at the end of the tunnel, I don't know about how it works over there, guys, but in, in America, when, you know, the se- senioritis sets in, Mm. And it's like, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. You know, C still gets me a diploma. I don't have to, 
you know, you kind of let the guard, and I noticed in online classes, if I did that, the experience was awful. And so I wonder if kind of expectation study, you know, that, that confirmation bias, some of the things that you're talking about, Jeff, maybe that's super important, especially in, in this kind of setup, because if the students come in realizing this is going to be a good experience, but it's really on you to pull as much of this as possible, maybe that changes the, the dynamic a bit. Well, I, I, you know, I reached out to the people who were, who were signed up for the in-person course and said, look, you have a choice. I, we can, you can come on my next course, which isn't until November, so like six months, eight months away, something like that. Uh, or we can give this a go. And, you know, if it turns out to be horrible, you could still go on the November course. You know, it's, it's still an option. Um, but, you know, I've been testing things and I've been looking at things and been working with other professionals and I've run it by a few other people. And you know what? I think I was pleasantly surprised by what I found out. And would I prefer situations and circumstances to be different? Absolutely. You know, do I think I'm, I'm going to make this the best course ever straight away? First time right out, right out the bat. No, but there's a small part of me that is actually a little bit excited about what this could be, you know, I, and I, I like the idea that this is something new and I've liked what I've seen. I, I like the features that I've come across and I think this could be something pretty cool. I think you're right. And I think it's, um, I think it's actually <clears throat> pushed me certainly to rethink because you, you um, we all get a little bit guilty. It's me certainly now I get guilty of, getting a bit repetitive, the same old jokes, you know, the same, you know, the same, the same old stories. So it will force me to kind of, you've got to, you, you're using different muscles, right? So you're actually, you're going to have to probably check in with your audience, maybe a lot more um, audibly than you might do in a class that you would do vis visually. So it's going to be stretching me and maybe even slowing me down in certain areas that I would normally do a lot quicker. But equally, it might be speeding me up parts of my, my class that might actually ordinarily be quite slow. So it's, it's an interesting, it is quite exciting. And it's, it's nice to break out of that, um, that mold and, and that uh, repetitive process to perhaps try something of a different. I'm quite, I'm, equally, Jeff, I'm, quite, I'm nervous about it because it's a bit unknown and there's new risks. There's always new risks that, you, that I haven't um, encountered before. The tech risk, the internet speed risk, um, is a big one. Yeah. So it's um, the connectivity might is the unknown, but it's 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 kind of a nice thing. And and people, I think there's a lot more goodwill. I, I think it's, you know, um, a lot of people are, are, are they've realised now that we are in this predicament. We we have to work from home. We have to find a way to make this work, to keep our economy going, to keep our business alive. So we have to pivot. We have to be able to respond to change, which is what, you know, what we should be able to do as trainers, as well as what we're teaching. We should be able to do that ourselves. Ryan, you mentioned about the onus being a, as much on the learner as the, as the educator. Um, uh, since, cause you've been doing this a while and you know, you're experienced now. Have you, have you noticed, have, has that changed from an in-person perspective? Have you had less, people who've turned up to a class thinking okay teach me you know it's on you to to le make sure that i leave knowing stuff has that changed and has that been down to you or has that been down to other factors yeah so I, i've actually seen students who who show up kind of in that stance on day one and i you know i make it clear within the first 10 minutes that what you put into this is what you get out of it i think what's the the big difference between the the in-person and the online is that for an in-person course like we can see when someone's on their phone and we can, we can see the distractions and it's, and I'll even walk over and say, Hey, you know, what can we do here to help make this more beneficial for you? And someone might say, Oh, I'm sorry. My kid's school just texted and it wasn't anything to do with the class. Or they might say, you know what? Yeah, this is getting boring. And so we try to put things in place that move on. I think the problem with the, maybe one of the, the opportunities with this online class is we got to figure out, you know, cause right now we're on a zoom we're, we're discussing, but I could easily, like I just clicked over to email and I could start getting distracted. And maybe you guys would not be none the wiser. Maybe I would, you know, I think people can start drifting off and it's going to be harder to catch that. Yeah. And then that leads yeah. to a, a cascading, you know, poorer performance and people not getting out of much as much out of it. And, and so I, yeah, I just think it's going to be harder to catch on. And so the, 
you know, reading the room is a big thing that we do in these classes. And we know, all right, we need to call a break here, or I just lost everybody, or the concept clearly isn't hitting right. But with the online stuff, those, those cues, uh, I think we're going to have to over-index on checking in with people. Like, are you yeah. still getting value here? Or give them a way to, I mean, I'm sure you guys know the Elmo rule, right? Enough already, let's move on. <laughs> um, or enough, let's move on. You know, and are there ways for them to cue us uh, so that we're not sending them down in these directions that, that they don't like? I mean, does that make sense? No, it certainly does. I mean, when, when Paul and I, we were, we were discussing how to chop this up into smaller sections, primarily because of that, right? It's much, it's harder. And, you know, I, I find myself drifting off on audio calls. I was saying to my yeah. wife yesterday, I, I, I noticed that I was um, responding to an email and I, and I was like, gee, gee, I caught myself doing it. I said, Jeff, stop, close, close the program, you know? Reduce the opportunities to be distracted. Close the programs. Put your phone on the other side of the room. Turn off the notifications. So there are some things that you can do to help yourself. But equally, that's something that I, I want to be more mindful of uh, rather than I want everybody else to make me more mindful of. Yeah. So yeah. we break it up into smaller too, sections. I, I just, I'm curious too, like, so, so for me, if I, if I run a, a PSM in the next month, and I'm, and I'm considering it, Todd and I are, are working really hard to figure out if this makes sense. We're probably going to do like four, you know, three to four hour sessions, like four half day sessions. Like there's no way you can, I don't think you can do a two day, you know, six to seven hours in front of a, a computer kind of class, right? I mean, you almost have to break this up. Yeah, and I think when, when Jeff and I discussed this, um, we almost thought, it would be very, it would be probably much shorter sections. It would be something that's divided up. Normally in a, in a two day class, you'd probably, you know, the, the general advisory is, is, is no more than 90 minutes before people get, you know, need a break or whatever that might be. But I think on an online course, I think it's probably for me, certainly it's going to be even shorter than that. There'll be short, probably more breaks, more, um, more time downtime as such to to do an exercise or whatever that might be on screen but you've got to yep. you've got to vary it i think a lot more because you will lose people in front of a um, a zoom you know for for eight hours it just it won't work i don't think it will work um so i think you the the variety of your educational design has to has to cater for that kind of you know static um, learning experience you have to be able to vary it up um, and even even dipping dipping offline and doing a task and coming back so one of the things I'm going to do uh, next this week um, I would ordinarily do the marshmallow challenge which is kind of a you know kind of a stock scrum scrum class example but it, it can't do that in a virtual setup I can't do that um, um, with the people in the room together around the table so what I'm going to do is ask people to view that as part of the course in a separate yeah. window, or be on mute, run it for run, run the, the the TED talk for whatever it is, 12, 15 minutes, and then debrief that the video as a as a class afterwards. So it's it's different ways of getting the same message across. Um, and I want to I pull you up on that one. I want to pull you up on that. Go on. Just just because of the language you use, that you can't do that. And I, I, you've known me long enough to know how annoying I am. Um, <laughs> and so my instinctive response when someone says you can't do something is, I bet you can. What did I and say so you can't do? What did I say? You can't, can't do the marshmallow challenge. And so <laughs> now to me, I'm, I'm, I'm now driven to try and prove you wrong on that. That's yeah, just, I know that's just <laughs> I know. who I am. And so I'm thinking, so in the joining instructions, what's stopping you saying, right, before you turn out, you need to bring this to the class as well as bring a pen, as well as make sure your phone's on silent you need to bring some spaghetti and a marshmallow and some sellotape mm. and some string. All right. And they just do it on their own. They don't work in teams. Sure. But they still get to experience doing something. Um, and I just think just as a, a fundamental high level thing, if you like of this, this is our opportunity to completely challenge all of our assumptions about what we do, how we do it, why we do it. And that, that sense of, well, Maybe it is a great opportunity to find something new than the marshmallow challenge, but do that mindfully rather than yeah. thinking, so, oh, I can't do that now. You've got me to, to, pile well on, to pile well on a little bit. Um, so I like this. So everyone has their own string, cello tape, um, spaghetti and marshmallow. 
they try it on their own for a bit. If we dump them into like different Zoom groups then and show yep. the best ideas of each, and then they all refine it, pick one way and debrief the class, you just did the challenge. I love it, Jeff. That's, in, that's awesome. In a distributed Thank way. You. Yep. So you got you, you, Paul. You wanted to <laughs> challenge my challenge. Yeah, shall I leave the call now? Is that, is that, is that my part done? <laughs> no, my, um, you know, bless her, my, my wife today, she, um, she was trying to help. She, she, I, and luckily, my wife doesn't listen to these, these, um, these recordings or these podcasts, so I can say what I like now. But um, <laughs> I think she was, she was really trying to help, and she was trying to suggest different ways that I can run this virtual class. And she said, you know what you should do? Um, you, should, um, you should do like a musical version. And I went, I, my immediate thoughts was, that'd be ridiculous. Uh, and I, I shut her down far too, far too quickly. And she said, well, no, instead of doing like a, you would normally do like a physical product, like a Lego thing or, or like a, a physical thing they can do around the table together. Get them to run off around their houses and find things that make noise and make music, you know, make, make a tune. They can hum something together and, and they can integrate that, uh, record it. And I, my immediate thought was, that'd be ridiculous. But to, to be fair, it, everything, like you said, everything now is kind of up for grabs. I mean, we always knew your wife was smarter than you. For the benefit, <laughs> for the benefit of the tape, I'm now opening my can of Guinness. Simply, you wonder what that noise is. So happy St. Patrick's know, Day. Happy, happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, you know, it's interesting. We're going, to, we're going to teach Scrum Masters online. I wonder if this gives birth to the remote Scrum Master. And is that what, what you think it's going to be? Today? No, no, no. Um, but you know what? That's probably going to be an amazing topic in a few months here. Like, what does that that role look like in a remote setting? Yeah, and, exactly. and how do we how do we still meet our service levels? Our how do we meet the the services to the the, the dev team, the product owner, and the organization sitting at home? I think that's yeah. a huge topic of consideration coming up. It is. Right? It's going it's to make scrum masters um, out there really stretch their. Um, the, the extent of their their ability to lead and to provide and to um, support people when they can't see them, definitely. Do um, do do you still teach the art of the possible, Ryan? I say you still. Is that something that Scrum.org still promotes? The art of the possible. I'm I'm not familiar with it. Okay, so years ago, um, when when Ken was teaching me how to teach scrum one of the the things he would say if you forget everything else about scrum scrum is really about the art of the possible it's about yes, yes. Out yep. where you are right now and where you can get better and he used to tell the story about you know it's not about getting the best people in the room and most highly skilled people because highly skilled people will be successful regardless whether they use scrum or whatever they'll just, they'll just do whatever so scrum is about finding out what is possible and then doing that and then working out what's possible next uh, and that requires a sort of you know open-mindedness it requires a, a sort of positivity of mindset it requires uh, creativity it requires experimentation uh, and all of those those characteristics of, of that of that remote scrum master are going to have to be amplified more than some of the other characteristics you might rely on more and that metaphor you use Paul of different muscles I think is a really really useful one Did that, does that speak to you, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's still something that we talk about inside the, the four walls of scrum.org is um, the art of the possible. And, 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 late, and recently, actually, it's Melissa Boggs who said, um, and I'm, I'm going to butcher the way that she, she, she put this to me, but the next, uh, the next right thing, yep. you know, trying to yep. figure out what's the next right thing to do and then do that. And then since respond, you know, probe sense, and then try to do that next right thing. And, and I, you know, it's empiricism at its finest, right? We're supposed to figure out, you know, how do we, what's the next possible right thing to do? And, you know, these remote scrum masters, and if I'm at home and I'm in a scrum master role, how do I help? And how do I, so maybe it's teaching teams how to use Zoom breakout rooms, or maybe it's, um, you know, go, stepping up and figuring out, I know we're not supposed to focus on processes and tools, but maybe for the moment, proper tooling will allow individuals and interactions to flourish. And yeah. uh, I'm fascinated by, you know, how the, there might be a paradigm shift just a little bit. And I think some of the ideas are going to get spun on their ear a little bit, but um, 
Yeah, I, I think it's, I see a world of opportunity. I think if we can help scrum masters get grounded in what's coming up, and it's something that Todd and I have talked about, like, I think we're going to do a series of just free webinars where, you know, scrum masters, if you're struggling uh, with this new remote setting, let's figure this out. Let's discover together what this role looks like. And, and I don't know if we've got dates or anything like that for that for it yet, but I think this is the new, uh, could be the new normal for a lot of people. Like what happens, for example, if companies realize uh, this just worked and we don't have to come <laughs> in the office anymore. I mean, that's, that's a possible outcome of this whole situation, right? Sure. Could well, could well be, yeah. And if you, if, I don't really want to get too philosophical or, or even, I don't know, maybe it's political, I don't know, but I think Paul and I had a meetup group recently when, when this first sort of came out and wasn't, didn't know whether it was serious or not. We were talking about, well, it's not going to be the last time that we get a, a disruption to society like this. It's been overdue, really, the, the amount of globalization that we have. And the biggest threat on our, on our collective radar is, is climate change. And you know, this is going to yep. take a massive chunk out of our carbon emissions globally. Yeah. So if we can prove that we can do it now, why, why couldn't we accelerate things or at least you know, keep some of this as the new normal? There's bound to be some good come out of this. I saw um, a tweet today about, um, it was a, two photographs in Venice, Italy. Um, and there was a photo of the, I should know the river, shouldn't I, that, 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 that goes through, through, through Venice. But um, the water was so clear that um, the fit, you could see fish swimming upstream and you could see, and the swans have returned, they said the swans have returned to Venice. Oh, is this it's, because of the, the lower number of um, tourists? Yeah, so it's it's that kind of it is that kind of is um, trying to something that we talk about. It's, it, I'm, I'm very careful to, with my words here because I know there's a lot of bad stuff happening, but trying to reflect on everything from both sides, both positive and negative, in terms of what what can we take from this, what can we learn from this, and um, the thing that also uh, reminded me uh, the words that you used, Ryan, I think was was checking in. Mm. We talked about checking in with people on training courses. But um, yesterday, I rang my dad, I rang my mum, I rang my sister. And that, is, <laughs> that sounds like I'm a bad, a bad brother, but I don't, it would be quite rare that I would actually pick up the phone and ring my sister. And I think maybe, maybe good Scrum Masters will be checking in with people to see if they're okay. You know, because yep. if, you, if you haven't heard from someone for 20, 24 hours and they're in your scrum team, if you haven't heard from someone that afternoon and then your scrum team, maybe it's time to check in. Chef, you're smiling. Why are you smiling? Only because I can see your kids running past the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're having a good time outside. Yeah, uh, I, I think you're right, Paul. I think we're going to have to really... Uh, I think the people skills are going to really shine here and uh, checking in with people like just emotionally, like the yeah. last few days, I'll even admit, like I'm supposed to know better. I'm supposed to um, be the yeah, empiricism is great. We're going to inspect, adapt. We're going to respond to change. My, I've been unfocused. Like I, I've, I've really struggled to get uh, my head wrapped around what's next and what we're going to do. And like, and, and most of us are in pretty privileged positions too. And I think that's important to acknowledge that, you know, a lot of us are going to weather this just fine. And there's a lot of people who aren't. And so I have a lot of concern for family members who are in a service-based industry. And, and here in the United States, especially in the state of Indiana, our governor just ordered, you know, all restaurants, all bars, um, everything closed, um, except for the essentials. And so, you know, if you work in a, in a hospital, clearly it's open, grocery stores remain open, pharmacies remain open, but a lot of small business have just been closed down. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, start thinking through that and you just get unfocused and you get kind of, um, you know, your brain drifts. And so even for us that know better, I think sometimes the emotions uh, get, uh, take hold. And, and if it can happen to us, can you imagine people who are, you know, not trained in this, in these practices and not trained coaches and, can you imagine what they're going through right now and just really locking in on that and how do we check in and help and call? And I think uh, Scrum Masters for the next few weeks, you're going to be spending a lot of time just asking, hey, are you okay? Yeah, and you know what? That's a beautiful part of the role, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I, I just um, just had a call about um, 
I was I was being asked some questions you know, from a leadership perspective. What 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 should leaders be doing? As you know, as if I'm the authority here, but I, from an opinion perspective, there's a lot of anxiety, understandably, and there's a lot of fear. And when there's fear and anxiety, we we generally re respond emotionally, and those emotional responses generally tend to be quite um, closed, closing. Wow. Um, so without that sense of safety, without that sense of comfort, we generally hunker down. We generally think very narrow and it's all about self-preservation. There's very little creativity in there. There's very little reaching out. There's very little collaboration. There's very little uh, room for vulnerability and, 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 and things that we know we need to be successful in a, in a knowledge economy. And so for me, my, I, I don't know whether this is true or not, but my, my opinion is that from a leadership perspective, the number one thing that you can do is, is to provide that sense of psychological safety for your people. Now, yep. with psychological safety, to get psychological safety, what do you need? Well, you need a certain level of physical safety. You need a certain level of yeah, um, just environmental safety. But also what goes with that for me is that, that, that over communication, because especially if you're remote, you're not, you're not going to have that connection. You're not going to have the opportunity to just pick up on bits of conversation that's going on. You're not going to, and so when you, when you are in the dark, metaphorically, you tend to start getting a little bit suspicious and, and you know, downcast uh, and, and thinking the worst of a situation. So the responsibility for me of a leader is to keep the conversation going, to keep the communication going and not just about how bad things are and yeah things are bad i get that yeah. um but there's 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 lots of things going on and i don't know I, you can pick all sorts of studies about you know you need if someone if someone upsets you and you've got one data point about that person being bad you need 20 data points of them being good for you to get back to equilibrium and trusting them again and i think the similar thing in terms of news so over communicating about the good stuff what's going on you know the, the good news stories of neighbors that you've never seen or, or or heard of putting cards through your door saying do you need anything oh. you know that that's a good news story but you probably need 10 of those to get past the 24 hours of everything's going to hell in a handbasket yeah true yeah I, I that psychological safety is critical i so I, we, we teach leadership classes and, and some one of the things that immediately came to mind was that um, I think we have to shift the way we, we respond to things as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, with our kids right now, if we're watching the news, I, if it's, I, what is it, BBC over there for us, it's, um, for us, it's CNN or Fox News. I'm sure you have them over there too. If you spend too much time on that. If you're talking about that, especially in front of your kids and you're not choosing your words carefully, you can just freak them out. Yeah. Right. And I think as leaders, when someone shows up with something disruptive, upsetting, unexpected, I really had to, like when I was sitting in executive roles, I had to get in the habit of saying, how fascinating, what new opportunity does this lead to? Mm. It took a lot of practice to not just, you know, what do you mean we didn't get anything during this sprint? Or, or what do you mean the, the customer's upset? It's really learning to pause for a moment and realize the next thing you say is going to impact not just the person in front of you, but that'll cascade out through the rumor mill, through discussion, through, you know, whatever it is you want to call it. And I think that idea, I love that, Jeff. I think you're, you're taking this very positive tone towards it. It's, you know, how fascinating, what new opportunity does this lead to? What's the art of the possible? And I think the more that a scrum master can do that, the more that leadership can do that. Um, I think it just keeps everyone else sane. It, it's just, well, wait a minute. So they're looking for opportunity. They're looking for what's possible. They're not panicking. Um, it sets an appropriate tone, I think. It's also being mindful and think of what you have, what you do have control over. Yeah, because a lot a lot of this um, stuff is happening to us, mm. and being reminding people of, you know, there's a safety here in knowing that we have no control over what's going to happen next, and we are in that kind of chaotic stage that we just don't know what's uh, around the corner. Nobody. There is no expert here that can tell us what, what to do next. So, you know, we'll stick with each other and we'll, you know, and we'll, 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 there's some safety in numbers here as well. That it's if a we, fundamental um, tenet of stoicism, isn't it? If you can control it, then do whatever you can to control it. But if you yeah. can't control it, let it go. Um, and so I, 
I, I appreciate the fact that you're, you're seeing sort of positive stuff in, in, in what I'm saying, but on the flip side, people then will sometimes accuse me of being very flippant and, and, you know, not really paying attention and giving credence to the seriousness of what's going on. And that's not my intention. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't encourage leaders to say, ignore all the bad stuff and just, just be positive. That's not, that's not the point. It, you've got to, don't be naive. Don't pretend yeah. this stuff isn't happening. That's not going to help anybody. Uh, but make sure that you're being mindful so you use uh, taking a you know, pause have a pause and that's the difference between responding and reacting and yep. i think the more that we can get into the habit and helping other people just pause think about it and then respond rather than just emotionally react yeah i yeah that that pause like esther derby does the the center enter turn you know, get yourself centered, decide how you want to enter a situation, then decide how you want to turn it. Mm. I think that's really important. Like that pause is, uh, it, it, it's just, it's so powerful, right? It, it, I think that's, it's a, it, that's a game changer idea in and of itself. And I'm certainly not pushing the idea that, that we are ignoring the bad, but I think Christopher Avery's work here is also really important, like through the responsibility process. Um, and his, uh, his, you know, his whole thing is, look, there's things that we cannot control Mm -hmm. but we can control how we respond to them. Mm. And that's the, I think that's the important shift, right? So Jeff, with your pause and with Christopher's idea of, look, this is happening to us. How do we respond? And then being at full power to decide how best to do that. Um, you know, those are the, the practices, at least I, I've, you know, have really leaned into Christopher's work lately. Um, just trying to get myself correct. Cause it's like, I can't help other people if my head's wrong. Like that's one of the biggest, and I took that lesson from you, Jeff, um, in your coaching book, um, kind of your lesser known book, maybe, but the coach's case book was, was really important. Like a lot of biases, a lot of things that go on in your head. And one of the big takeaways from your book for me was, man, if my head is not right, I'm useless to other people. Mm. And so I really have had to sit down and get recentered on, all right, how, what can I decide to do faced with, with, with circumstances that are out of my control? how do I choose to respond? And that's brought a lot of power back to um, at least my perception on situations. Does that make sense? Or? Oh, it certainly does. I mean, it, it, it's, it's sort of erring me towards perhaps a too deep response um, and, and almost going the other way to, to when people are accusing me of not taking this too seriously enough, maybe I'm taking this too seriously, but comparing it to <laughs> Victor Frankl's work, which is where that, that I think Avery was inspired by, you know, it, the, uh, the film the, a beautiful life was i think it was something like that um and it was the the nazi concentration camp where the guy and his son are are in this concentration camp and everything's obviously awful um but he was the only person that spoke uh or understood what the guards were saying and so he chose to interpret the the guards instructions to the other prisoners in a very positive way um, and the, the, the message is that you know, you, they can take anything away from me, but they can't take away how I choose to respond or how I choose to interpret a situation. Um, so it's quite deep, but that, that sense of I can choose how to interpret this. I still have control over that. Yep. And it's not that I can necessarily change the situation, but sometimes how I react will change the situation. Look, th this stuff's going to happen. Uh, COVID-19 is going to play out exactly how it's going to play out, regardless of whether or not I worry or show up in a joyful, positive way, right? Mm -hmm. Is it and the same? Kind of, yeah, sorry, sorry, Ryan, carry No, on. Paul, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, is it the same situation here with panic buying in the supermarket? Yep. So you see, and I'm sure and from what I've read, the US has a similar uh, problem that I went to my local supermarket today. You see one person buying milk. Or you see, it's in our supermarket. It's porridge. You can't get a box of you can't get a box of porridge or uh, oatmeal for for love nor money. Uh, but you see one person buying it, and then you see two people buying it. You think, okay, there must be a shortage. So then you feel that you have to buy it, and it kind of breathes. That even though there might not, there isn't a food shortage, but it creates this fear, this perception of a false reality that that, that there is, and you mm -hmm. kind of just follow that. That, that, that decision-making process, because if everyone else is, is scared, I should be, I should be scared too. Mm. We, we've decided, so yes, we are having, um, it's not as bad as, as it is in Europe yet from, from what I've read, but 
we are starting to see like I went to the store yesterday and my wife and I have been very mindful where we're not trying to hoard anything. We're buying what we need, yeah. what we can foreseeably predict we need for two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we'll buy a couple loaves of bread. We bought a couple dozen eggs, but we're trying to minimize what we take because everyone else needs things too. And, and it, it was mind boggling because we, I was in the, the dairy section of our grocery store and we, I'm pushing a cart and there's literally someone with like 10 gallons of, of milk in their cart. <laughs> and I just kind of turned to the person. And I said, I, I totally, I totally get how you're feeling, but half of that will spoil before you and your family drink it. And they just looked at me funny and kept walking. And I, but, but there's this idea that, you know, yeah, it, it, it's really bizarre to watch it play out, but um, yeah, it's one of those where we can decide. So we've decided uh, we are going to only, we're minimizing purchases to bare necessity. Um, we're going to try to leave room for others to, to get their needs met. And, and we're going to see how that plays out. But, um, but that's how we've taken control of our situation. Like we are intentionally doing that. It's kind of, you know, living through intention rather than going to the store and mass buying and mass panicking. And, and for us, it's left us with a, 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 a greater sense of calm than what we've seen in other people. Mm. Mm. Yeah, your, your, your comment of worry, Paul, makes me think um, something that I, I can never remember. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a, a really good succinct quote about this. But something like if if you worry, you suffer twice. Yeah. Uh, and again, it's not it's not about not worrying because worrying is helpful. It it helps you avoid risks. It helps you mitigate risks. But sometimes a lot of what you worry about doesn't come to pass, and yet you've suffered for it anyway. You you've had the anxiety, you've had the worry, you've had the stress, and it doesn't happen. And then if it does happen, well, you get the impact of it. So you you kind of suffer twice. Um. And I think there's there's an element of that, and then it's contagious. So, all right, the virus is contagious, but so is worry, so is fear, so is pessimism. But equally, so is optimism, and you know, so so is your your mindful behaviour. People see that, and they think, okay, so not everyone is is crazy. So not everyone is panicking. <laughs> there are some logical people around. I want to be more like that person there. And so by doing that, not only are you, you know, being a good citizen, but you're also helping spread that more mindful response. Mm. Yeah. But it's scary, right? There, there's, there must be a small part of you that thinks, mm, but what if I'm wrong? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. And that's plus with three, three kids in the house, mm -hmm. um, a family to take care of. You're like, you know, where, where's the balance? Where's the, you know, how it, yeah, it, it is. But at the same time, it's, I still believe, and maybe this is me being naive, I still believe in the general goodness of people. And I still believe that as communities, we will figure this out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I hope that belief is not misplaced, but I, I cannot, for some reason, my brain won't shift that off. Like I still have to believe that regardless of, of evidence to the contrary. So <clears throat> I'm trying to think of something else. Oh, so it was um, reminding yourself to say, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you have to get yourself into that habit. And I think that that ritual, giving yourself some kind of ritual to, to, until you get into that habit and having to remind yourself, just, we will solve this as a society. Um, whatever it is, if, if, if you, you know, part of a team thinking, okay, we can do this. Um, we, we can tell the truth. Yes, we can commit to this. No, we can say no to that getting into some kind of ritual, some kind of habit that helps you develop a new set of behaviors or new muscle memory. It takes a lot of repetition and conscious incompetence, if you like, to get to a point where you do that naturally. Yeah. And that's, you know, again, I, I don't want to turn into an infomercial, but I, it's why I'm a big fan of Christopher's work. He just, uh, he teaches these skills and I've, like I said, I've leaned into them. You know, Jeff, I've referred back to your coaching book as well. Um, it's just been a, a good time to, I, I mean, we have some free time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's been a good opportunity to kind of brush back up on some of those skills and just realizing, you know, that, that pause, that alone is just uh, wildly valuable. But the ability to just sit back and say, all right, I can choose joy or I can choose misery. And I love your, your, your comment there, there Jeff, where, 
yeah, if you, if you choose misery or you choose worry, you're going to suffer twice. So let's just be joyful and let's figure out, yes, it's a very serious situation, but how do we, man, how do we uplift other people? It's kind of like that servant leadership mindset. Let's, how do we, how do we make sure everyone around us is thriving? How do we make everyone around us um, is doing well? And in return, I think we end up okay. I think it plays into your, your favorite phrase, Paul. Yes, and. <laughs> you never know, it might take off. The, you know, it's very easy in these situations to say, yeah, but what about? Or we can yeah. choose to say, yeah, okay, there's a start. There's a starting point. It's not enough. And if we did this, it would be even better. You're right. And there's also a lot in this about, um, I was talking to someone who's based in Germany today on the phone. And um, she said she wants to be, she, she, so she kind of finished the conversation. She was talking about the, uh, what's happening over there in, in Munich. And she said, I, I want to be part of the solution. I don't want to, I want, don't want to be part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So it's, she said, it's not necessarily about me, me now. It's about making sure I don't compromise someone else. I don't put someone else in, in danger or in jeopardy. So by being very mindful about social distancing and, and trying to um, minimize, like, like you said, Ryan, about only taking what you need off the supermarket shelves, you allow, it's about looking out for your community, looking out for the people you live next to, tapping, knocking on the door, putting, putting a letter through, saying, can I get you anything? Can I get you any milk or, or bread, whatever that might be? If people take the approach that it's not just about them, it's about someone else, which again, is a very much a scrum master, an improv, um, looking after your partner, making your you partner. You wrote a lot about empathy debt recently, didn't you? About how we, are, we need to increase our empathy. And if, if anything else, this is gonna teach us to, to you know, have more empathy. We, we should be practicing empathy now on a daily basis. Yeah. Our, our, how is your, how are your team? How how is your next door neighbour? Um, yeah, and and we're doing it probably personally as well as professionally on a, <laughs> on a daily basis. We should be. Well, how many of you? How many people out there are now thrust into a, a remote working situation where they're not used to um, being at home in the first place? And maybe they're now working at home with a spouse where they're not mm. used to. Maybe they're both working from home now. I've I've heard I've had friends that have talked about that quite a bit. And now mix into the fact that almost every school in the world has been shut down. Mm. So now our kids are in the midst. Mm. And, and how, how far can empathy go to make sure that, you know, it, it's very easy to spend your day yelling, right? <laughs> and it's very, like the kids, like my kids just busted in a little bit ago and I, I you know, gave my daughter a quick hug and, and told her very nicely to move. I mean, it's very easy to turn and get upset, to snap, to, and, just realizing, man, we just have to really turn up the empathy and realize, first of all, we are going to be at home with these people for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, I think for a number of weeks, at least, given current forecasts. And how do you want it to go? Do you want to be yelling? Do you want to be upset? Or is it time to just say, man, these are just little people who are scared too. And uh, I, yeah, let's just give everybody a break. And mm -hmm. so I, I think that's super important, right? New situations, new conditions, new context. Uh, the nice, yeah, I, I can't think of a better way to, to make this uh, situation go better than to just show a little grace and to have some, some empathy for what other people are experiencing. Mm. I, I talk um, in my one-to-one in my, in my -one coaching, one of the, the common threads is coming back to something I was mentioning earlier on, actually, but in a different context, assumptions. Uh, yep. What are we assuming are going to be the consequences? So I don't know what what went through your head when when your when your daughter opened the door and came in while you were in the middle of recording a podca podcast podcast podcast. Um, but uh, I I was just happy to see her. Yeah, I, I wasn't upset at all because I think a lot of people assume that other people are going to react differently to how they will. Uh, not necessarily in that situation, but just as a, as, a, as 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 a flippant example. But sure. assuming that other people are going to react badly makes us worry. And actually, a lot of those worries are unfounded. So maybe it's because it's an informal setting. Maybe it's because you know, you're, you're pretty, pretty grounded and you, this is fine. Um, but some people would be worried that that's going to make them look unprofessional or that someone's, the person they're talking to is going to be frustrated or whatever. But a lot of those worries are unfounded. And just freeing yourself up from those, those worries can be really liberating. Oh. 
Yeah, the art of not really caring about what other people think. Um, and unfortunately, it took me until I was about 35 to learn that trick. And uh, once I turned that corner, um, things got a lot better. And so, uh, and, and plus, you're right, this is safe. I don't think you, Jeff, or Paul, you guys, I, I'm sure when my kids came in, you chuckled. And Paul, we've been watching your kids play behind <laughs> you for the last hour. And I've actually enjoyed it. They seem to be having a blast. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but you're right. So yeah, right, Jeff. Uh, all of those, you know, all those assumptions, like, oh, they're gonna think I'm, a, you know, what we're drink. I'm drinking a beer at, <laughs> at twelve thirty, and it's now one thirty in the afternoon. I, I we professionalism's been thrown out the window, so it's yeah, can't worry about that anymore, right? Yeah, we've dragged you down to our level, um, and we appreciate you for joining us in the gutter, right? It's a lunchtime drink. Is you allowed a lunch lunchtime drink? That's fine. Oh no, no, I. I, I, I love talking to you guys, so I'm, I'm more than happy to, to throw down a can and, uh, and to join you. That's good. Ah. Cool. So, um, yeah, for, for those, I can't imagine that any of the, anybody who, uh, who listens to the Agile podcast won't have come across Agile for Humans um, because it's been around a lot longer than we have and has a much bigger following. Um, but if you haven't, then check it out. Um, and you can go back and find, I don't know, how many episodes have you done now, Ryan? We're well over 100. I, yeah. I'd have to look. Well over 100. So, you know, you can easily find something that's uh, particularly interesting. And with all the time on your hands now, it's a great opportunity for, for professional development uh, and, and, uh, and, and finding some little bit of quiet time to put some headphones on. But we, uh, well, we I, genuinely appreciate you for, for, for allowing this crossover to happen. And Oh, I... I, I love it. And, and Jeff, like I, I think I've mentioned your, your work quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a, a big admirer of what you put into the community. And so for the agile for humans listeners, check out Jeff and Paul, if you're over in the UK and you know, when, uh, when the context permits, definitely check out, like I even want to fly over at some point and check out your advanced scrum master class. Like I'm fascinated to see what you guys are doing over there. Mm. And uh, so hopefully we can make that work out someday. Um, so definitely check out Jeff and Paul. Um, Jeff's books are, are they're amazing. Uh, Scrum Mastery, Product Mastery. I think Team Mastery is going to be coming out soon, right? The file went to the printers today. So, so unless the printers get shut down, it shouldn't be too long. Perfect. So excellent books. Uh, his coaching book is also, oh, I'll make sure there's, there's notes and uh, there's links in the show notes. Paul, I, do you have a book out yet? Yeah. Yeah, I can send you the link for that. That's no problem. Cool. So, I mean, these guys do great work. And so I more than happy to, to push that stuff. And I, again, equally thrilled that I could join your, your pubcast and enjoyed having a beer with you this afternoon. And I hope we make this a more normal thing. I uh, yeah. certainly enjoyed uh, hanging out with you guys. That's great. Well, look after yourself and your family and um, uh, hopefully it won't be long until we speak again. Likewise, guys. Take care. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, Jeff. Cheers. Bye.